Resourceful Designer, episode 137, eight tips to avoid burnout and motivate yourself. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. First thing he taught his kids when they got their driver's license was how to change a tire. Mark Dickout. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have what I think is going to be a great episode this week where I'm going to share eight tips to help motivate you in order to avoid burnout. I'm also going to share a resource to help make the best first impression you can for your business before ending the episode with a great question from Amy about drive defragmentation. Now, I would love to know what you think of my new release schedule. If you may have noticed, a few weeks ago, I switched from releasing on Fridays to now Mondays. I had put a poll in the Resourceful Designer Facebook group, which you can get to if you're not already a member, at resourcefuldesigner.com slash group. And be sure to answer the three questions I have in there. A lot of people are trying to join the group and not answering the question. And it doesn't matter how qualified you look. If you don't answer the three questions, I decline your request to join. But in the group, I asked if it mattered to anybody what day. I had been releasing on Fridays, and I said, what day of the week would you prefer I release on? Now, a lot of people said it didn't really matter to them, but more people said Monday over any other day of the week. The funny thing is, is Monday was the number one, followed by Wednesday, then Tuesday, and nobody picked Thursday or Friday. So I had been releasing sometimes on Thursday, sometimes on Fridays all this time. So now I switch to a Monday morning release because that's what you asked for. And I'd love to know what you think. Leave me a comment for this episode at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 137 and let me know what you think of the new release schedule. Now, I've been plugging away this week at a few different jobs, working on some podcast artwork. I started a small website, nothing really too major, just a small website for a local client. And I'm still waiting on that brand job that I told you about last week. Everything was agreed upon. They sent me the deposit check. I have the check sitting right in front of me here, but I've yet to receive the signed contract. They claim that they've signed the contract. I just don't have it in front of me. And uh, if you think back a couple of episodes ago, episode 133, was it 130? Yeah, 133, where I shared 12 red flags for spotting bad design clients. That was one of the thing, clients not signing the contract. Now, in this case, this client is not refusing. They claim they've already signed it. I just don't have it. And until it's in front of me, I've told them I'm not going to start any work. So they're going to get it to me and then I'll start working on the new brand for their business. And it's one of those things where I'm really looking forward to it. It sounds like it's going to be a great client. It's going to be a really fun project to work on. And even though in my mind, I've been going over some ideas for this brand, I haven't actually sketched anything out or done anything on the computer yet because I'm going to stick to my guns and not start anything until I actually have that contract. Even though they did give me the deposit check, I'm going to wait for that contract. But as soon as I have that, I'm going to hit the ground running with that one. But that's pretty well been the week for me. Now, like I do every episode, I try to share a resource or tip of the week. Well, this week's resource is my very own four-week marketing boost. It's been a little while since I've mentioned it, so I thought I'd bring it back and let you know, in case you're new to the podcast and you haven't heard about my marketing boost before, what it is is it's an ebook I put together that you can get by visiting marketingboost.net. And what it is is 20 small tasks, things that can take you I'd say anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes per day. And if you do them for 20 days in a row, that's hence the four-week marketing boost, you do one per day for 20 days, at the end of the four weeks, you will be in a much better position to create a great first impression for any time a new client comes to you. Because as you know, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And if you don't succeed that first time, there's a good chance that client has moved on and has found another designer elsewhere. So by following these simple things that I have in this guide, you can fine-tune your marketing material so that you create the best chances of landing those clients when they find you. So once again, if you're interested in that ebook, it's absolutely free. All you have to do is sign up at marketingboost.net. And if you're in the USA, you can also get it by texting the word marketing boost, all one word, to 44222. Now that only works if you are in the United States of America. Once again, that's Marketing Boost. Text it to 44222. 
And now, eight tips to avoid burnout and motivate yourself. Now, running a home-based design business is stressful work. It takes motivation and it takes dedication in order to avoid that burnout that I'm talking about. But what do you do when your motivation and you're feeling that dedication is waning? As a solopreneur, you are probably a very busy person. I know I am. And you're either spending a good amount of your time trying to get new clients or spending a good amount of your time trying to please those clients you already have. Probably both of those scenarios. And doing it all by yourself can take a lot out of you. Now, of course, having a team to help pick up some of that slack can help. And if you want to know more about teamwork, listen to episode 77 of the podcast, which was titled Being a Self-Employed Designer Requires a Team Effort. And you can get to that one by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 77. But face it, you embraced this freelance lifestyle because you wanted to be your own boss. You wanted to make your own rules. You wanted to do things your way. That's why we all did it. I know that's why I did it. And it's one of the best things about being a home-based designer. You're in charge and you get to decide how things work. But being in charge and doing everything yourself can become overbearing at times, especially when your business is really busy and you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Now, your business being busy is a future topic I'm going to discuss in the uh, future episode of the podcast. But today, I want to share eight tips to help you avoid burnout and to help motivate yourself to keep on going especially when things are getting tough. So tip number one is to find inspiration. Without inspiration, your creativity will stagnate and it'll fizzle out. Look for things that'll rejuvenate your creative juices. Make time to do things that gets you excited. Go visit a museum. Take a course, whether online or in a class, and learn something new. It doesn't have to be about design. Just get those creative juices going and learning something new helps. Talk to a coach or a mentor if you have one. Sit down and watch some YouTube videos on creative things. Again, it doesn't have to be design. It could be anything. But instead of watching those YouTube videos about funny college parodies or what the latest cat's been up to, watch videos on things that you're interested in. Maybe a hobby if you like to do gardening or woodworking or you like working on cars Look at those sort of things, things that'll motivate you. Listen to podcasts about your favorite topics, your hobbies. Even podcasts about TV shows. I do a few podcasts about different TV shows. And I listen to a few as well. And it's great because sometimes the enthusiasm you hear on the podcast is infectious and you start to feel it yourself. And all that stuff that can help motivate you, even though it's not related to your design business. You can also listen to TED Talks or watch videos on TED Talks. Those are great ways to motivate you. They have some great ones. You look through at all the different topics, what people are talking about, and some of them are so inspirational. But whatever source you choose, be it a podcast, an article, a course, a video, whatever you choose, make some time for yourself and do something that energizes and excites you because it'll help you move forward. Now, the second tip I want to share is to relax and recharge. If you're one of those people who's always on the go, 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 you need to learn how to slow down and take some of that time to relax every once in a while. Take a few hours or better yet, take a day, if not more, and forget about your business. Forget about your clients. Forget about the projects you're working on. They'll still be there when you get back. If you don't take regular breaks to relax and recharge, you'll end up hitting a wall at some point and feeling crushed by the weight of everything that's on your shoulders. Because again, running your own home-based business all by yourself is stressful and can feel overbearing. So turn off your computer, turn off your phone, disconnect yourself from email and social media and all those other anchors that are tying you to your business and do something calming. Read a book, take a walk, spend some time with friends and family. Separate yourself from the stress of your business life and take time to enjoy the life 
that you're working so hard for to begin with. Because there's no sense putting in all that hard work if you can't enjoy the life it's giving you. Now, tip number three is to appreciate your accomplishments. Sometimes when you're working for yourself, trying to get by day by day, it's easy to forget everything you've done to get where it is you are today. So take some time to appreciate everything you've accomplished, everything you've done to reach where you are, and feel some gratitude for all those things and all those people that may have helped you get there. Now, this applies to both big and small things. Think about everything you've done in your life to get to the point you are right now. Think about the people that have helped you along the way, that have encouraged you along the way, who have given you some motivation along the way. Think about them. If you've never done it, reach out and thank them. Because all those things help put you in the spot where you are right now. But while you're thinking of those big things, don't forget all the small things that you've done to help you get where you are. And it can be as small as the things you checked off your to-do list today and yesterday those small tasks that you've completed, all of that, everything you've done is part of how you got to where you are right now, right this minute, where you are, all those things led up to that for you. And those things deserve to be acknowledged and appreciated. So take a minute to think about them. If need be, to thank somebody or just acknowledge something. And just by doing that, you will feel more motivated to keep on going. Now, tip number four, is to look at the big picture. Take a few minutes and review the goals you've set for yourself and your business. Now, if you want to know more about setting goals for your business, I did do an episode on this, episode 55, which was setting goals for your design business, which you can get to at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 55. But take some time to examine and reassess what is still important to you in regards to your goals and What isn't as important anymore? Are the goals you set for yourself still relevant? If not, you can change your trajectory. Now's the time to adjust your goals accordingly. Revisiting your goals will help you focus on what is important for yourself and what is important for your business and allow you to realign yourself so that you have a better chance of success in reaching those goals. So if you haven't set goals already, Go back and listen to episode 55, which tells you all about setting goals for your business, and then take the time to reassess them every once in a while to make sure that everything's on track and you're headed in the right direction. Because it is very easy to lose track of that sort of thing with the day-to-day work that comes upon you, to lose track that maybe you wanted to be something uh, or somewhere a year from now, and that year has now gone by. Have you reached it? Maybe you set a a five-year goal and you're halfway there. Are you on target? Do you need to realign? Do you need to reassess? Do you need to reevaluate your goals in order to better achieve that goal that's still a couple of years out? So take some time to look at the bigger picture. When you have a fresh goal in mind and you know exactly what you're working for, you have a more chance of being motivated for it and less chance of burnout. Now, tip number five is to stop doing everything. One of the problems with being a solopreneur is the overwhelming feeling that you need to please absolutely everyone and you need to do everything that's asked of you. Learn how to say no, especially if what is being asked of you doesn't align with those goals that you set for your business. I was just talking about goals. Well, if somebody asks you to do something that's not in line with those goals, then learn how to say no. If your goal is to become a great web designer and you don't want to work on print design, you don't have to take on jobs that have to do print design. It's okay to concentrate just on the web design part of it if that's your goal is to work solely in web design or vice versa. You cannot do a good job when you're trying to do everything. You spread yourself too thin and it just doesn't work. So learn how to become selective of which projects and which clients you want to take on. Now, for more information about this, there was an episode I did not too long ago called Nine Situations When You Should Say No to Your Clients, and that was episode 129. And there's also, back in episode 42, It's Okay to Say No to Graphic Design Work. 
And both of those can be reached at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 42 and slash episode 129, respectively. Now, tip number six is to audit your client ROI, the return on investment you get from your clients. Before you get to the point of feeling unmotivated and are on the cusp of burning out, you should run an ROI audit on your business and your clients and get rid of anything that doesn't fit with your goals. Going back again to those goals, they are so important. If you don't have goals for your business, you have no way to measure what sort of success you have or if you're achieving what you want to achieve. So with those goals in mind, examine which clients and which projects are the ones that will help you get there, which ones you enjoy the most, and which ones are bringing in the most money. And then spend your energy focusing on those ones, those clients and those projects. And for any clients or any projects that you have that you don't enjoy doing or that are giving you the least amount of ROI on your time, either try maybe raising your prices so that you can bring them up in line with the other stuff that you are enjoying and that are bringing you a good ROI on your time. Bring your prices up to those or simply let them go. It's okay to tell a client, even if it's a long-term client, that I have to bring my prices up and and if that means no, then sorry, we're not going to be able to work anymore. And you know what? A lot of people are afraid to hurt a client's feelings. There's no feelings hurt if you tell the client that I know we've been working together for a long time, but I have to expand my business and that means raising my prices or, or stopping to do whatever it is you're asking of me in order to progress. And the client will understand. Maybe they'll be willing to change with you to pay you more or whatever, or they're just going to thank you for the work you've done for them and they'll find somebody else. Because if you stick with it and you keep doing those things, it will affect you. Losing motivation and feeling burnout happens most often when you're forced to work on projects that you don't enjoy working on, especially those who bring in little return for your time. Now, tip number seven is identify and eliminate your bad habits. Bad habits can often lead to feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. Are you checking your email or your phone too often? Do you jump to see what each and every notification that comes in is about? Are you repeatedly hitting the snooze button in the morning to avoid starting work? Are you eating unhealthy foods throughout the day, which is in turn making you feel tired and making you feel sluggish? These are all bad habits that we get into. Sometimes we don't even realize we're getting into them. And the more we fall into these bad habits, the more it can lead to a lack of motivation, causing you to feel burnt out. You have the power within you to identify and eliminate these bad habits. If you're having a hard time getting up in the morning, try to go into bed a little bit earlier. Or maybe it's just a matter of whatever you're using for your alarm. If it's your phone or an alarm clock, Sticking it out of arm's reach, forcing you to get up out of bed to turn it off might be all you need to help you get up in the morning. When you're working from home, it's very dangerous to have access to the fridge and your pantry and whatever food. And chances are, if you're in the middle of something, you don't want to take the time to go grab something healthy. It's a lot easier to open up the cupboard, grab a couple of cookies or a a few chips and then get back to work. Well, all those things will will harm you in the not just health-wise but they will make your your productivity suffer. So try to identify these habits and eliminate them if you can. And in doing so, it'll help keep you motivated and it'll make you more productive. Now, the last tip I want to share with you today is to get out of your comfort zone. Try doing something different for a change. You have a laptop? Try working from a different location for a change. Either a different place in your home or go someplace entirely different. If you're not used to working from a coffee shop, go work at a coffee shop. If you find the environment too noisy, try working at a library or someplace like that. If you normally work 9 to 5, try changing your schedule and work maybe, I don't know, 1 to 9 or 11 to 7 or, or whatever. Or break up your day. Give it a try for a few days and see what happens. Sometimes changing your routines can have a great effect on your personal well-being, and the way you're thinking about your business. 
Now, different people have different times of the day when they feel the most productive. Some thrive on mornings. I am definitely not a morning person. Others peak in the afternoon, which is my time. I love the afternoons. That's when I feel the most invigorated, the most alert. And some people are most alert at night. I'm very alert at night, but I'm not creative alert at night. That's why I don't like working on design too much in the evenings, because even though I feel alert and I'm motivated, my creativity is down in the evenings. So try to figure out when your most productive time of the day is and schedule to do your most important work during that time. If you are one of those morning people that get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and you have this super boost of creativity and energy, schedule your most important tasks and projects for 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Get them out of the way and then as that productivity or as that creativity starts to wane, then you can start working on the less important stuff for the rest of the time. A change of scenery or a change to your schedule can make a world of difference and completely change your outlook on your business and, and just on everything in general. Not only that, but getting out of your comfort zone causes your brain to reassess its surroundings. And as it tries to acclimatize itself to those new surroundings, whether it's time-wise or space, it'll be pumping extra mental juices, if you will, that'll help channel inspiration and it'll make you think more creatively. So as I said at the beginning, running a home-based business is stressful work. It takes motivation and it takes dedication in order to avoid burnout. But knowing what to look for is the first step if you are to succeed. And I hope that these eight tips that I just shared with you help you to stay focused, that they help your creative juices and get them flowing And that by following these tips, you become a more productive designer and a better entrepreneur. And that you never have to deal with burnout. Because the happier you are, the more successful you'll become. Now, I would love to know what you do to avoid burnout and what you do to stay motivated. Please leave me a comment for this episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 137 and let me know. Now, I have a question of the week, and this one came in from Amy, and I apologize, Amy. This is a question that slipped through the cracks. I was going back through my emails. I mentioned last episode how I'd cleaned out the email box for my my design business, which I'm happy to say I still have zero in there. Everything that's come in since last week has been properly organized, and I'm still at email inbox zero for that account. But for the podcast, Resourceful Designer, I was a little bit behind there. So I started cleaning and organizing that. And I came across a few questions that had somehow slipped through the cracks. Every once in a while, I'll I'll, I'll be asking, I, you know, I'm low on questions, please send me questions. And then in the span of a day or two, I might get three or four questions that people who have listened to that episode send me in a question. Well, sometimes I'll mark them and I think, okay, I've, I've answered that one, I've answered that one, I've answered that one. And in some cases, I might have skipped some. And this is one that I wasn't sure. I was going through the emails and I read Amy's question and I looked through the website and I don't think I ever answered this. So Amy asks, she says, I listened to your spring cleaning podcast. And for those interested is episode 36, spring cleaning for graphic designers, which you can listen to at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 36. And she says, the episode was helpful as usual. I have this question for you. After eliminating all the unneeded data from my hard drive, Do I need to run some sort of program to defragment, as in the old days, or something else? Or is it simply good to go after emptying the trash? And if I do need to defragment, how do I do that? Thanks again. Well, thank you for the question, Amy. And once again, I apologize for taking so long to get to it. Now, for those of you who don't know, defragmentation of a hard drive is something that, yes, we had to do an awful lot back in the day. And that was a task where what it would do is whenever something is written to a hard drive, it's not necessarily written in a straight line. Meaning if you write, I don't know, a 10 megabyte file, it's not one 10 megabyte section of your hard drive that file is written on. It could be two, five, 10, a hundred different sections on the hard drive with little bits and pieces of the file all over the place. And what happens is computers used to slow down a lot because of that, because it was looking all over the hard drive for information. 
And when you would defragment a hard drive, it would take all that information and it would rewrite your hard drive, putting those things in a, a proper order to make it easier to find. Because what would happen is as you would empty your trash, it would free up a space here. And then the next time you would write a file, that space would get uh, would get filled up with the new file. But if the space wasn't big enough, part of the file would go in there and then another part of the file would go into the next available space and so on and so on. So every once in a while, you had to defragment your computer. and I know from doing this, again, way back in the day, you can get drastic speed and bumps, improvements on your computer after defragging your hard drive. Now, things have come a long way since those days. Amy, you don't specify if you're on Mac or if you're on Windows or what type of computer you have. First off, if you have a solid state drive, an SSD drive, you do not need to defragment them. There is nothing you have to do with those drives. If you have a traditional spinning hard drive, this day and age, it doesn't really call for it. If you're on a Macintosh, you don't really have to defragment. You can if you want, but you're not going to see a whole lot of improvement, not like we used to. Now, I didn't look into exactly what there is. There used to be programs to do it. Uh, I forget which ones I used to use, actually. So I don't even know. I haven't thought about defragmenting my hard drive in years. Now, what I do do, especially if I'm doing like, uh, as I talked about in that spring cleaning episode, if you do a lot of cleanup and you're deleting a lot of stuff from the hard drive, I usually will go into the utilities folder on my Mac, which is in your applications folder by default, or you can get to it by pressing command shift U on the keyboard. And in the utilities folder is a program called disk utility. And I will often just verify the disk and I would repair the permissions. And that's just something I've got in the habit of doing. I don't even know if it's required or not. It's just something I do. Anytime my computer is running a little funny, I will run disk uh, utility just to make sure. It used to be called disk first aid. Now it's called disk utility. And I'll run that just to make sure everything's okay. Because sometimes as you run installers or you're doing things, the computer changes permissions on files and every once in a while it forgets to put them back to the way they were. So running through that and fixing those things does help, but you're not going to see a lot of improvement. So to answer your question, if you're on a Mac, I wouldn't even bother with the defragmentation. Uh, I don't have a solid state drive. Mine's a traditional hard drive. And a rule of thumb is if your hard drive is less than 50% full, then you don't have to worry about anything. If it starts getting up, you'll might notice some slowdowns. Once it gets to about 80% full and above 80%, that's when you'll really start noticing some... uh, slow down on your computer. And if that's the case, you might want to think about getting another hard drive, but defragmenting won't really do very much. Now, I did a quick search on Windows and there's somewhere, uh, if you're on a Windows computer, and again, this is just Windows 10. I didn't go back through older versions. If you're on Windows 10, there is a way for you to check the fragmentation of your hard drive and it'll tell you a percentage. You know, it's 10% fragmented, 20, 30, 40. And there are some recommendations there that anything over 10%, you can defragment it. But I, the, the article I saw said that they wouldn't even bother if it was under 60%. But the program is actually built in for Windows. So if you do need to do it, you can run it directly from there. So I don't know how feasible it is. I don't have a Windows machine. I've always been a Mac guy. So I don't know how feasible it is to, to or, or how required it is on the Windows side. But on the Mac side... When you do the spring cleaning, as I said, just empty the trash. And then I run disk utilities. I don't think it's really needed. It's just something I've always done, and I do it on a regular basis myself. So that's what I recommend. But as for defragmenting, no, I wouldn't bother. Now, again, that's just my opinion. Other people might have other opinions. And if somebody does have an opinion on that or or don't think I'm right in my answer, please, again, leave a comment for this episode at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 137. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. So thank you for that question, Amy. I do appreciate these. And once again, sorry for taking so long and getting back to it. There are a couple of other questions that are in the same boat that I must have missed over time. So I'll get to those. But I would still love to get your newer question. If you would like to submit something to the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit your question. Now, I don't have any iTunes reviews to share with you. There are no new ones that came in this past week. But I can tell you that iTunes is available in over 150 countries, 153 or 54, somewhere around there. There are over 150 iTunes stores around the world, and I have received reviews from 14 of them. 
And I would love to see more countries in my reviews list. So far, I've received reviews from the USA, Canada, Australia, the UK, India, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Sweden, Netherlands, Spain, Kenya, Philippines, Bahamas, and South Africa. So thank you to all my listeners in those countries for submitting reviews. If you're in those countries and you haven't, you can visit your local iTunes store and leave a review. But especially if you're in a country other than one of the ones I just mentioned, I would love to get a review. And you could be the first one to leave me a review in your country. Because I just have a small percentage. only 14 countries with reviews out of over 150 countries available to have reviews in. So I know the last time I asked about this, I, I think I was at 10 or 11 in a couple of countries that were not listed. People submitted reviews. So I'm hoping to do the same things happens this time. So again, if you are in a country that other than one of the ones I just mentioned, I would love to get a review from you. I would still love to get a review from you if you are in one of the countries I mentioned. But either way, and wherever it comes from, it doesn't matter what country, I will be notified about it and I will read it on the podcast. So to leave your review, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, and that should redirect you to your local iTunes store where you can leave a review for the podcast. Now, before I go, I'd just like to thank everybody who's supporting the podcast via Patreon. It means so much that you are willing to donate just a little bit of money, even if it's just $1 a month, less than the cost of a cup of coffee, for you to say, here, Mark, thank you very much for what you're doing. I'm treating you to a coffee this month. So thank you very much. All that money, all the proceeds that I earned through Patreon help to support the podcast paying for audio hosting fees and the website and the domain and that sort of thing so that I can continue bringing this great content to you. So thank you to everybody who is already a Patreon member and supporting the show. And if you are not and you would like to become a patron of Resourceful Designer, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And for as little as $1 per month, you too can become a supporter of the show. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I want to remind you again about the resource of the week, which is my four-week marketing boost. If you want to give the best first impression you can for your business, visit marketingboost.net or text the word marketing boost, all one word, to 44222 if you're in the United States. Until next time, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best with your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.